Okay. I am Madeline Brown. I met Lyndon Johnson in 1948 and had a 21-year relationship with him. I had a son by him, Stephen Brown, that passed away It'd be 10 years this month. Um, we had a beautiful relationship, and even today, as I talk about him, my toenails still turn up. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Oh, where do you want me to go from here? <laughs> uh, well, tell me a little bit about uh, your uh, your family history a little bit. Oh, my family? Yeah. I was raised or reared by the most wonderful parents that anyone could have. They were really orthodox Christians, and they lived totally by the Ten Commandments. They were, uh, I'm sure my father gave away as much as we had in our home. And even to this day, there's a mission that Mother Teresa established in, let's see, what year was it? And where I, our home, our homeland. And I still support it. Uh, but where I grew up, and I've often said that this mission is, is just a living on of what my father what he did in the old Trendy Heights area. Okay, uh, now let's talk about uh, the events surrounding uh, John Kennedy's uh, assassination. Uh, what, uh, what do you know happened just prior to the uh, assassination. Why don't we go back to 1960 <clears throat> okay. at the con Democrat convention in California. And this came back first handed from John Currington that was an aide to H.L. Hunt. Um, when they met in California, Joe Kennedy, John Kennedy's father, and H.L. Hunt met three days prior to the election. Um, they uh, they finally cut a deal, according to John Currington, and H.L. finally agreed that Lyndon would go in the second, or uh, as a vice president. I know there's been lots of talk about this, but this came from the horse's mouth way back in 1960. And when H.L. came back to Dallas, I was walking up uh, Irvy Street, which I did almost daily with him, and he made the remark, we may have lost a battle, but we're going to win a war. And then the day of the assassination, he said, well, we won the war. It, it was a total political thing, a political crime. And H.L. Uh, Hunt really controlled what actually happened to John Kennedy, he and Lyndon Johnson. Uh, well, let's talk about the uh the planning of the assassination before it happened, uh, didn't it go well, back it, about a year or so before? Oh, it, it, uh, it, it started after the, uh, the convention. H.L. Hunt didn't let it rest. He immediately, they went to mapping a, a plan out of, or a plot, how to get rid of John Kennedy. Uh, they were just in total disgust with John Kennedy. Well, where did they meet to, to hold these discussions? H.L. Uh, Hunt had, of course, property everywhere, but they had this lodge up close to, it was outside of Dallas, and they would meet there, and they uh, he chose different people to, to do certain things for him. And uh, I, I'm sure it went on about two years prior to the assassination of John Kennedy. About where was this lodge? The best I recall, it was north of Dallas, and it was on a, well, it's over by a creek. It was very scenic, and it was very secluded, and you really had to be invited there yeah. because if, you, you wouldn't know how to get there. Did, did you go out there with Hunt? I, I have been there, but uh, it was for a social rather than any planning of the assessment. No, I, I know you were not invited in the planning, but I no. mean socially. Socially, yes. Okay. I'm sure I'm one of few people in Texas that was socialized with all the high rollers. And again, we called them the 8F group. They, um, it was uh, 
fraternity among these people. Well, let's talk about the 8F group. What do you mean by 8F? What does that mean? Uh, it was, the best I recall, it was their room number at the Lamar Hotel in Houston. And they would meet there for various things, but mostly for gambling and, and making, cutting business deals. Who were the members of the 8F group? Uh, they had to be the great white fathers of Texas. Primarily it was your your oil people, your your high rollers. Uh, by name, who do you? Oh, there was George and Herman Brown were probably the biggest of all of them. And Hunt, Clint Murkison, Sid Richardson, uh, again, Hunt all Hines. the big... The, the finance, I guess that's what I'm looking for. I mean, for. was Hoffines there? Uh, Judge Hoffines? Judge Hoffines, yes, he was part of that group. Uh, John and Connelly? And occasionally, okay, yeah, John Connolly. Occasionally, uh, uh, our FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, would appear there. He hobnobbed with those people, and particularly Clint. That's an uh, interesting subject. Tell me more about the relationship of uh, J. Edgar Hoover and H.L. Hunt and Sid Richardson and Clint Murchison. What, what do you know about uh, that? Well, the first time I met uh, J. Edgar Hoover, I was at the Driscoll Hotel. I had met Lyndon probably six weeks or so before. And we were dancing there in the Driscoll. And uh, I looked up and I saw J. Edgar Hoover and his companion, uh, and Clint was the C. Was Richardson. Yes. Tolson? I beg your pardon? It was named Tolson? Yeah. And I remembered from the 30s the G Man series. So I said to Lyndon, I said, Isn't that the G Man? That's what I called him, you know. Yeah. And he said, Little girls shouldn't have such big uh, eyes and no ears. And he said, You forget what you saw. But I met him that night. Yes. Were you around when uh, J. Edgar Hoover was with Hunt or Richardson or Murchison? Or well, they were, they were at the party the night before the assassination. All the high rollers in Texas was at Clint's the night before the assassination. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about that, that meeting at uh, Murchison's house. Uh, when, when did that happen? It was the night before the assassination on Thursday night. At uh, November the 21st, 1963? Yes. Okay. What, about what time did it start? Well, I was called and told me that they were having the social, and of course I was ready to go to any social. I think I must have gotten there around 8, and um, the party was breaking up probably 10, 30, 11 maybe. May, I guess it was 11. And uh, uh, we were all stunned when Lyndon came in. What time did he come in? It must have, well, he came from Houston. It must have been around 11 o'clock. The party was breaking up mm -hmm. at that time. And it, it shocked everyone that uh, he came in. Of course, I was thrilled to see him. Normally, I knew his agenda when he was in Texas. But that night, I did not know that he was coming. And they all went into this conference room. Who called a meeting? Uh, Clint did. Clint? Yeah. He's, what, what did he say? He says, come on, boys, you know. I thought they were going in and gamble because they gamble, yeah. you know, so much. Okay. But the, the meeting didn't last, or Lyndon didn't stay that much in the meeting. And when he came out, he uh, I thought he was going to say something yeah, uh, sweeter. First of all, where, what part of the house was the meeting in? It was in their conference room, and, of course, the home was huge. They yeah. had... Uh, the social was out, well, the best I recall, in the library area. Uh-huh. But he had a conference room? Oh, he had a conference room. They all did. Okay. Now, let's talk about who you know were in that meeting. Well, In, my, in the private meeting. Yeah. One of my very best friends that dates way back to the 40s, a George W. Owens, one of the most colorful persons that anyone could know. And to show you how colorful he was, uh, he would hang around Jack Ruby and he would, uh, the Abe Weinstein was right next door. And George was courting Candy Bar, and I know the name Candy Bar rings a bell. Anyway, when she got, uh, I guess you'd use the word busted, 
for marijuana charge was with her and it caused a big big scandal but from there he uh, of course he played uh, varsity basketball for SMU and there we had Joe Campisi these people are is a real close knitted group yeah. of people so through the years George identified with Clint Marcus and he I don't know how many business is that he uh, he was involved with and you'd see Clint and Sid, you'd often see George. Well, what was uh, George Owen's job with uh, Clint? With Clint, it was various uh, businesses that they were involved in. There was some building and, and some oil. and But George had such a wonderful personality. I can envision him, how he got involved with Clint Marcus. And, okay, now what what was his involvement with that meeting that night? He was there socially, and, and of course Jack Ruby had brought one of the call girls to the meeting. I don't Who know. Who was she? The the call girl. Yeah. I've been told her her name was Shirley. I know her, uh -huh. but she doesn't want to talk about this. Okay. Uh, well, now. I, I knew the girl. Yeah, but you you said earlier something about. Uh, George Owens had picked up somebody at the airport or yeah he did the day of on Thursday uh -huh. of course Dallas didn't have the big metropolitan airport right. it was Lovefield very small right so he went out to Lovefield and he picked up John J McCloy and uh, Jagger Hoover uh, it seems like Pierre Charles Cabell was with that group the best I remember of course there was a lot of you know problems there. Mm -hmm. Who else did uh, George Owens pick up at the airport? The, those were the ones that George said that he uh, recalled picking up and taking them to Clint's. Uh, now who, who picked up Nixon? Nixon was already in town. Okay. He came in on Tuesday and met with Lyndon that no one knew anything about. Yeah. But Lyndon met Nixon in Dallas on Tuesday. Where would they meet? I'm not sure uh, exactly where their meeting was, but I do know they met. But uh, Nixon was staying where? He was in one of the local hotels, the the Adolphus, as I recall. Okay. Well, did uh, did any of them spend the night there at uh, Markerson's house? Well, I'm sure they did. They had the facilities to do so. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's now let's talk about the people that that you recall were were in that private meeting. Uh, let's go over them one by one. Okay. Uh, who, who do you recall were, were at well, this Of course, meeting? the ones that I remember the most were Jagger Hoover, McCloy, Hunt, H.L. Hunt, uh, John Currington that was always with Hunt was there, and uh, George Brown, Brown and Rue. I'd have to look at a list. It's been so long ago. Okay, I've, here's a list. Do you want to go over that list uh, to see if any of them ring a bell to you? Well, let's see. I've already named Clint, Hunt, Lyndon came in, McCloy, Nixon, Eamon Carter. Eamon, uh, Eamon G. Carter, Jr.? Yeah, he, uh, Eamon used to say he wouldn't be caught alive or dead in Dallas and yet his son died in Dallas, yeah. Texas. <laughs> well let's let's go over the list and then we'll talk we'll talk about them one by one. Of course George Brown, Earl Cabell the mayor. Uh, I do not recall seeing R. L. Thornton but he was usually there. B. R. Sheffield. John Conley was where there was one of the Democrats they usually were close by. Right. Uh, Joe Yarber. Now, Raph Yarber was one that I knew better than anyone, but Raph did not get along with Lyndon. Uh, Raph used to say that was the, well, I can't use the profanity, right. <laughs> <laughs> but that it was, he was bad news. Okay. And W.O. Bankston, he was usually always around. You know, W.O. was a real colorful person, too. Yeah. Well, let's, we'll go into details with him. Okay. Let's go over this. Jagger Hoover, I have said. Clint Peoples. Bill Decker, the sheriff of uh, it's Dallas County. Cliff Carter was, uh, 
I'd known Cliff. As a matter of fact, Cliff and Billy Saul were friends. And Billy Saul, Lyndon is one that introduced me to Billy Saul. Yeah. You told me we'd discuss these. Yeah. And Malcolm Wallace. Malcolm E. Wallace. <laughs> I've known him since hmm, prior to the uh, problems in Austin. And the uh, Mafia, Carlos Marcello. Marcellus? Yeah, Marcellus, I think. And I always called him Joe Savella. Uh -huh. How do you pronounce it? That's Joe Savella is the way I'd pronounce it. Well, he was the head honcho in, in okay. Dallas. Jack Ruby. Yeah, he's an old buddy. I've known Jack a long time. Larry Campbell. Okay. Now let's uh, let's go over these one by one and, and just tell me what you know about them. You mean personally? Personally. Uh, Clint Markerson, tell me what you know about Clint. Well, Clint I had known, uh, I guess, early since the 48s. And Clint, of course, was a multimillionaire. And how he got his start, and he often talked about it, in Washington, was he married a girl, I'd like to believe her last name was White, out of Tyler, Texas. And the president of the United States at that time would come. They, there was a connection. I think it was Taft, the best I recall. So Clint's family were old bankers, old money. And with his uh, connection in Tyler, he met Jagger Hoover through these connections, and they became life, lifelong friends. Uh, I always, this is off color, but because knowing Sid Richardson, the other oil man from Athens, Texas, never did marry, and what was the name, Russell from one of the senators from Georgia, what was his name, Russell, they were all bachelors or single men, and I thought they may have, may have had a little Jagger Hoover. I, th I think they hanky pankied around. So you think there was a, maybe a, a men's party that went on from yeah. time to time? Oh yeah, they they would go to <clears throat> Matagorda off of uh, Bay City and Matagorda. Texas. Yeah, they had an island down there, and they'd meet down there and stay, you know, days. So just all men. Yeah. Having fun. Having fun. Uh, what about? Uh, well, let's let's go on down the list. H. Uh, L. Hunt. Oh, I, I, I really, I really love that old guy. <laughs> I go up and down Northwest Highway, and of course he's buried there in uh, Spartan Hillcrest. But when I met H.L., he would uh, he parked at the same parking lot that I did off of Irvy. We'd walk up the street, and uh, the the first real regulation was, of course, the oil men would wear diamond stick pins and their big. Stetson and they'd drink coffee in this coffee shop and so it was at Christmas time the old man come hobbling in and and I said to the these very rich people I said why don't y'all take up a, a collection that old man it's Christmas you know let's let's have the Christmas spirit buy him some clothes he would wear patches on his arms you know and they who rod they said don't you know who he is and I said well, looks like he needs some help, you know? <laughs> and then they told me he's the richest man in the world. <laughs> I've, I've thought about it so often. Here he was, you know. He'd you, carry a little brown paper bag, and I think, well, God, he's hungry, you know? Yeah. You couldn't tell him by looking at him that he was very no, wealthy. No, never could. Never could. I understood he drove an old car. He did. By himself. He drove it. He, uh, he did his own chauffeuring. Mm hmm. Yeah, we we parked of course at the same parking lot, and, and I always had a new car and and expenses, so I would tip heavily. And they'd always the attendants would have my car out front, you know. And one day he said, "I don't understand it. They never wait on me." And I said, "H.L., don't you ever tip them a little bit?" Well, no, you know. And I said, "I do." <laughs> <laughs> that was the secret to it. Yeah, I understand it. Uh sometime before the assassination that uh, H.L. had uh, some flyers or something about Kennedy? Yeah, Tell me about it that. Was, it wasn't, oh, I'm sure everyone has seen this, wanted for treason, this uh, John Kennedy 
flyer and I got out of the out of my car and he says, Come here, I want to give you something. I still have it, you know. Yeah. I should have had him autograph it. And I looked down and I said, Oh, HL, I was so naive, you know. I said, You'll get in trouble. You can't do the President of the United States <laughs> that way. And he said to me, Well the hell I can He says, I'm the richest man in the world and he says, I'm having these passed out in Dallas, and what you did, downtown Dallas was plastered with those, sir, I'd call them a circular. Yeah. yeah. I folded mine up and put it in my, my purse, and... and um, you still got it? Yes, I still have yeah. it. If he'd have autographed, it'd be worth some money. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about uh, uh, Lennon Johnson. Uh, mm -hmm. let's, let's go into some details uh, about when did you meet Lyndon, and how did you meet him? And at, in, at the Adolphus Hotel in 19, well, let's see, it was the fall of 48. He had been in, involved in this Box 13 scandal, and uh, which was fraud, uh, and they were having a, well, a, a dinner for appreciation of, of Lyndon, the Democrats, and I was invited. And I was invited because here I was a real young girl, and every time we had a client that had any advertising dollars, we put them on KTPC Austin, whether they needed it or whether they didn't. A certain amount of the budget would go to KTPC. That was just understood. Uh huh. Was it was just... it was understood, and and I was told don't ask questions. So <laughs> early on, I knew there were a lot of political things. So uh, Jess Kellum, who uh, I think in the, at the end, later on, he really betrayed me. Called me and he said, put your dancing shoes on. We're gonna have a party over at the Adolphus. Well, here I was all excited. And that's when I met Lyndon the first time. You know, I, I always like to tell back in 1936 when President Roosevelt came to Texas to open the, the centennial and my first boss, Fred Florence, and uh, Jesse Jones from Houston was the ones that extended the invitation to Roosevelt. So here I was, just a young child, and uh, my father was very politically minded, so he said, uh, he helped me up on his shoulders so I could see the President of the United States, and as I looked across, there was this handsome guy and he had this NY8 poster, you know, and I was real excited. And I said, who is he? I, I began to kind of grow up. And, and um, so my, my father identified him. He knew him, I guess, from the newspapers. So then when I met Lyndon at the Adolphus Hotel in 48, I could still feel the bells and, and things. It, uh, it really excited me. And so when we, he asked me to dance that night, uh, it was like electricity in my body. And it never, ever ceased. Every time I would see him, I would have these physical uh, feelings about him. Very strong attraction. There was some kind of a charisma yeah. between the two of us. And I can talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday, when we were in downtown Austin, I passed the Driscoll and I passed the church. I, I used to, of course, I'm Catholic, and, and I do believe in confessions. And I'd say, well, I'd say, I'm not going to do this anymore. And I'd go right back and do it over and over. It was 21 years that I had the relationship with him. Uh, I understand that you gave birth to one of Lennon's children. I sure did. It was in, my son was born December the 27th of 1950. He was as much like his father as anyone could be. And the, the thing really, of course I would like to sear some of my conscience, we were Lyndon's second family, but I never had the uh, privilege of being, of course, the first lady or anything. But he did take care of his responsibilities. How did he do that? This uh, attorney, Jerome Ragsdale and Jess Kellum, uh, it was through the attorney, Jerome Ragsdale, that uh, Lyndon had it set up that we would be taken care of. Would he give you 
charge cards or well the it. thing that I could go get anything I wanted charge account um yeah but primarily uh Neiman Marcus in Dallas but uh, all bills went to Jerome Ragsdale in the Mercantile Bank the same building where Hunt they were all housed together and uh, it was real exciting I had perfume and flowers and clothes new car new car it was it was a very full life in that respect did you pay for your home and they bought me a home all your living uh, expenses and all my living expenses and anything i was told repeatedly if you need anything all you have to do is call jerome ragsdale but the way i was reared i was very thrifty and economical i never took advantage of it if i had my time to go over i would yeah. Not now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, tell me more about uh, what was your son's name? Stephen Mark Brown. I uh, I named him because of a saint. I uh, I asked Jess Kellum. I said, Does Lyndon want to have anything in naming or a part in naming the, our child? And he didn't. He. He was cold in one way, but he was warm in another. But if, during those years, if anything like this, particularly after the Box 13 scandal, it would have destroyed Lyndon Johnson. And I cared for him, and I still have warm feelings for him that I didn't want to destroy him. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, what happened to Stephen? Stephen, I know it's hard for you to talk about, but let's let's discuss it a little yeah, bit. The, 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 he passed. Okay, but well, where did your your sons? Uh, you, what you had two sons? I had two sons, Jimmy Glenn Brown, and his father, of course, died in a. VA hospital. He was World War II victim. He was your husband? Yes. I was legally married to him. Oh, and, uh, where did your two sons go to school? Texas A&M. Both of them. <laughs> Big Aggies. <laughs> well, the best, the, the best school in the entire world. Uh, yeah, I often, <laughs> when Jimmy started at A&M, my friends had written this Texas Aggie joke. And so uh, we'd gone to all of the parenting where to go to college and everything. Of course, SMU was right in Dallas and Baylor. And and um, so I told my son, I said, son, you've got to make up your mind where you're going to college. And he said, well, I'm going to A&M. I said, A&M? Of course, all these jokes were flying. I said, are you sure? And he said, yes, mother. So we went, we drove down to A&M to check everything out. So when I came back, I told my office, I said, Jimmy's going to A&M. Well, you talk about being who <laughs> rod, you know. Oh, he's going to be an Aggie, you know. Every once in a while I run into these people, and, and they still, you know, mention that. Yeah. Of course, when Stephen got ready to go to college, well, because his brother was an Aggie, then, of course, he, you know, wanted to be an Aggie. Yeah. We had a great time in those years. Yeah. It was military in those years. Right. Uh now, what uh, you'd mentioned uh, in the past about a lawsuit that uh, Stephen... Stephen filed a lawsuit uh -huh. after he found out for sure. Well, I've, ha I've had heart trouble, and I thought I was going to die. And I thought, well, it would be totally unfair to him not to know who he is and where he came yeah, from. Yeah, when, when did you tell Stephen that Lennon was his father? Well, uh, he was quite young. Uh, that he actually knew that he was his father. But this attorney, Jerome Ragsdale, would always sit in for everything, and, and people automatically thought Jerome Ragsdale was the father. Yeah. But um, after uh, Stephen filed his lawsuit, that's when our world turned upside down. Of course, he was an attorney, He um, and he said to me, he said, Mother, I'm entitled to that part of that estate. Yeah, whose estate? Lyndon's estate. When, when, when Lyndon okay. passed away? Um, and he said, uh, I'm going for it. And I said, oh, son, I know the political set up in Texas. I said, don't open a can of worms. And here he was. I mean, 
he was a spit image of Lyndon. He said, well, when I walk in that courtroom, I ask him not to file it in Dallas County because of the political right. things. He said, I'll automa automatically win my lawsuit. I said, don't count on it, you know. But he filed, and uh, it was really with regret, even to this day, that he filed that lawsuit. What were the provisions uh, of the court at that time? Uh, when were well, our, uh, our money stopped in 75. Lyndon, I think, died in 73. And Jess told the attorney that he was putting everything on hold because of problems in the, the uh, probate or settling the estate. But I can look back now, I think the two men, Jerome Ragsdale and, and Jess Kellum, they feel their pockets full. Yeah. Well, now, uh, Stephen was supposed to appear in court. Uh, why did he not appear in court? What, that let's was, go into uh, that a little bit. You know, I have a, a letter from Martin Frost and, and Phil Graham. Uh, it was real strange. Stephen had uh, served his time in the U.S. Navy. And uh, after he filed his lawsuit, the Navy suddenly decided that he was a, a deserter. And, uh, Even though he had an honorable uh, discharge. He had, he had an honorable discharge. So uh, they arrested Stephen. It was close to Christmas time, and uh, I, I was horrified. Stephen had already had cancer and was taking treatment. So to show you how they are, uh, the military and all of the mess, they picked him up. They first took him to Corpus, and if I had my time to go over, I would have sued. I would have made a big national mess out of it. Here he was. They knew he was sick. They handcuffed him, put him in a, a van, and drove him to Corpus. Well, from Dallas to Corpus is not a short trip. So when Steve got there, of course, I was already on the phone talking to people. They said his feet was swollen so bad they had to put him in a wheelchair. Well, when I got a hold of, the best I remember, it was Admiral Taylor. I said, you people have made a mistake. Well, what they did, he told me that they'd let him come home, but they didn't. They put him in an ambulance and took him to Brooks General Hospital in San Antonio, who has all of Lyndon's medical records. So when I found out that they had taken him there, I, I caught a plane and flew to San Antonio to see my son, whereas he came up missing. He was gone about two months. No one had given me an answer. but um, So you couldn't find him? I couldn't find him. But Stephen told after we did find him that they took the bone marrow. They did all kinds of testing to him. But the lawsuit was scheduled to come up into court. And it was very convenient that Stephen wasn't around. And at that time, I, I well, I, they would not have postponed anything because of the political thing, the lawsuit. So, the, so the, they, they, um, they're in Dallas County. They marked the uh, case, failed to appear in court, dismissed. And after that, I, uh, I had a friend in Washington. Uh, he's a well-known uh, detective. They located Steve. And he's often told me, don't, don't. You do not know, and I don't, how we got him back to Dallas. But Stephen, of course, ultimately passed away. Yeah. Now they, what, uh, how much was Stephen uh, suing? Uh, the ten million. Ten million. Or dollars. ten and a half million. I don't know how he came to arrive at that figure, but it was ten point ten point five million. And so the the, the purpose of them uh, saying he was a deserter was for, for what reason? To well, it was a way to. Uh, uh, get him where he couldn't appear in court, and then they could, they say, could throw the case out. Throw the case out. Okay, let's uh, let's go on to uh, a fellow named John J. McCloy. What do you know about John J. Oh, McCloy? Oh well, John has a colorful history too. You know, Chase Manhattan Bank, but he put all the finance together for Clint Murkison and. Uh, what was it? Well, after World War II, they sent John J. McCloy to Germany to uh, 
I guess, ruled Germany for whatever they did yeah, over there. I believe it's called Chancellor of Germany yeah. or uh, yeah. something and like that. And when he came back, of course, he, he picked up his role and with the oil people and went from there. End of the Chase Manhattan Bank? Yep. Yeah. Uh, what was his tie to Hunt and, and Richardson and, and Murchison? Well, he, he would put the finance plans together for the oil deals, as best I remember. Uh -huh. Did you ever meet John J. McCoy personally? I did. I did. I met most of these people off and on at these socials and uh -huh. things. But he was at Clint's house the night before the, uh, the assassination. Okay. Uh, how about uh, Richard Nixon? Uh, he was there, and, and what do you know about Richard Nixon? Well, you know, uh, Clint Markison. And I think I have a copy of that letter in my book, or if, if not, I have one, that Clint told Lyndon if he could get the support of, what, who was it, Senator Nolan and Richard Nixon, he could control America. And I've often wondered how the power did Richard Nixon, did it come from Eisenhower, or was it from some other source? But, uh, yeah. So Richard was there at the meeting? Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of people says he wasn't, but uh, you personally saw him there. Oh, he was in Dallas. Oh, sure he was. Okay. Uh, and you mentioned that Eamon G. Carter, Jr. was there. What, what do you know about Eamon G. Well, Carter, Jr.? Well, Eamon Carter, of course, was the political fellow from Fort Worth. He owned... Fort Worth Star Telegram, I think it was. Again, he was part of that 8F group, you know, finance, money, yeah. control in Texas. Of course, he, he got his power from his father. Probably. Uh, Amy G. Carter Sr., who had made all of the money and, and he inherited that. And Sid Richardson, you know, Sid was out of Fort Worth, too. Yeah. Uh, Tell me what you know about, you say George Brown was there. What do you know about George Brown? Well, I knew the uh, Brown and Root people. I knew them quite well. And, of course, in the 30s, the Root died somewhere along in there. So it became George, or the Brown and Root Company. And uh, they ended up with all the big military contracts and things. And that was because they hobnobbed with uh, Lyndon Johnson. So uh, Lennon uh, made sure that Brown and Root got military contracts and government contracts, and, and what, was, why, what was Lennon's part of it? Well, he got kickbacks. He had money, you know. Yeah. That's why the Vietnam situation went on as long as because of uh, uh, the money involved. So they, it was advantageous for that Vietnam War to last a long time oh, yeah. because uh, Brown Root and, and all the others made money off it, and, and, and Johnson got his share of it. Huh? Sure did. Okay. You know, we were talking about Stephen, uh -huh. and I've, I've waited and waited until the time that uh, I'd rather not say on camera who it is, but there was another love child. It was a girl, and uh, but she was well. I understand she makes about. 500000 a year. What are you talking about? Jack Blaney's daughter? Uh, yeah. Linda Courtney. Linda Courtney. Blaney. <laughs> her mother was uh, Mary Margaret. Uh, who, was she, who was her mother? Mary Margaret. Uh, what was her job? She w worked in Lyndon's office as a secretary. secretary. Okay. She has bitterly denied the story. Um, Why was the girl out of San Antonio has written a book on Lady Bird, unofficial biography. And, uh, of course, she had heard the story and she came to me. Of course, I get calls all the time, you know. I said, yes, I know about it, but I cannot prove it. I just know that it happened. So, uh, anyway, she, she put it in her book, but the uh, publisher had it pulled. Yeah. I'd have let it run if it had been me. They'd have sold a million copies. Yeah. Now, you'd, in the past, you told me a story about, uh, uh, I forget who it was, but uh, Stephen walked into the room, and, and whoever it was said 
something about Stephen and how you look so much. Oh, Linda and sister Rebecca. Okay. We were at the um, Adolphus Hotel. The Democrats were meeting, and uh, she was with. Uh, well, golly, I can't think of her name. Pearl Mesta from Washington. Right. So when Stephen walked in, of course he was a little fella, and they said, oh my God, that kid looks enough like Lyndon to be his son. And boy, did I ever get Stephen out of that <laughs> office. Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, I did. But now back to George Brown. Uh, Herman Brown had passed away before uh, this yeah, meeting. Yeah, he died before the... Uh, and Herman never did like uh, Lyndon. Okay. But uh, George was so deep into it that he couldn't. He couldn't was financially that. tied to it. Yeah. Okay. You know, uh, one of the, there's a lot of interesting parts to this. Like Sid Richardson died ten years before Clint. Yeah. And Lyndon died ten years before. George Brown. There, there. There's a lot of little, really interesting yeah. things in it. Uh, Earl Cobble. Who was Earl Cobble? Earl Cabell. Cabell was an old, old Dallas family, and his brother was Pierre Charles Cabell, and he was in the CIA, deb deputy director, I think it was. And Lyndon, uh, Lyndon, uh, John Kennedy fired him over that Cuba, the Bay of Pigs, and uh, Alan W. Dulles, too, I think, was involved in that. So they fired uh, Cabell, and that was a real raw spot with Earl Cabell, who at that time was mayor of Dallas and later went on to be congressman. But um, there was some real bad blood there, completely. Okay. But Earl you know, uh, his brother... A lot of these people have met sudden death, and um, Pierre Charles Cabell, I, I think it was Walter Reed Hospital, he went in feeling good, had a checkup, and when he came out, he was dead. Hmm. Like Cliff Carter, meeting yep. with Billy Saul, my life is in danger, they pull him out of a cheap hotel, you know, all of these things I don't think are coincident. Yeah. Uh. Oriel Thornton. Who was Oriel Thornton? He was, um, he, he was a colorful guy. He was a banker, Mercantile Bank in Dallas, and uh, he was one of H.L. Hunt's uh, kingpins, you might say. He made, uh, politically, he was, you know, involved. But again, all of Washington, uh, I know on my first job I bounced into Fred Florence, who was the president of Republic, and Harry Truman was in there. But at that time, I was so young, it did not impress me to meet the Vice President of the United States. It, you know, it wasn't that important right. to me. But they, they, for some reason, they all hobnobbed with each other. Uh, what was uh, Oriel Thornton's uh, political involvement in Dallas? He was a big Democrat, uh -huh. and uh, he and Lyndon were very close. Was he mayor at one time? He was mayor. Okay, before... Bible. Yeah, he was mayor before. Uh, and you said uh, that Oriel Sheffield was there. Who was Oriel Sheffield? I really didn't know Sheffield other than I would meet him, you know, from a social standpoint. Yeah. I, did, I really didn't know him like I did the others. But he was there to meet him? Yes. Okay. Uh, another see, they had, let's see, Louis Ar Arster Bar, Bar. Let's see, it was Pacific and these streets come together and it was kind of like a hole in the wall, and you'd see all these great white fathers going into Louis Oyster Bar. It was kind of like off limits to the females, but they would meet there and, you know, do their thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and but well, we'd see them do these things. It was, you know, different. It was totally different. You just yeah. were not supposed to talk about it. That's right. Okay. Another person you say was at the meeting is a fellow named John Conley? Oh, John Conley. What do you know about John Conley? Well, John Conley and my in-laws were related, <clears throat> and I remember seeing John when I was quite young. He would meet at, uh, come to family reunions, and I would see John Conley, and there was always a rival between John and Lyndon. Uh, 
I don't I do not know what really happened in the political field, but John Conley, I know the Democrats went to grooming him to be president and he 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 tripped up. He uh he crossed someone and then when John Conley went in Democrats for Nixon, there was a big breach at that time. And Lyndon made the remark he should have kept a closer eye on John Connolly. In 63, what was Connolly's job? Uh, he was governor of Texas. Okay. I had to stop and think. Yeah. He was a good looking guy, you know. Yeah, very personable fellow. Uh, another person that was at this secret uh, private meeting was a fellow named uh, Joe Yarbrough. Was he kin to Ralph? Uh, I do not know that connection per se, but Ralph Yarber, I know, hated Lyndon Johnson. You know, he refused to ride in the motorcade with him. Yeah. And uh, Ralph, even up, I don't think it's been too long ago that he passed away here in Texas. Yes. But he never changed his opinion of Lyndon Johnson. Yeah. He, uh, but do you know any details about Joe Yarbrough? Not really. Not okay. uh, But you know he was there. It uh, it was like Sheffield. I had seen them, but you yeah. know, I didn't really know basically. Was he the uh, one from El Paso? Joe Sheffield. Yeah, no, from, no, Joe Yarbrough. Yeah, from El Paso. Okay. Another prominent person that was there that you mentioned earlier was uh, W. O. Bankston. What do you know about yeah, W. O. Oh no, W. O. Railwell. W. O. was colorful. He ended up, of course, uh, one of the big automobile dealers. But he and Bill Decker, the sheriff of Dallas, who was also very colorful, uh, they uh, they hobnobbed together. They they were sort of the in mafia. Both men, W.O. and I'm not sure about Decker, but I do know that Decker, the police department had called Decker and said they were going to raid certain places and Bill Decker would, he owned the, uh, well, the casino things, the one-armed bandits. And uh, Bill would call whoever it was, said, get those machines out of sight. The police are going to raid us, you know. <laughs> but this is this is what went on in yeah. those years. Yeah. If they paid their dues, then nothing happened. I'm saying W.O. was uh, earlier years or during that time was the old mobile dealer in Dallas. Yes, big okay. one. When the, and it's still going. Yeah. He loved to gamble. He uh, he also loved the underworld, yeah. and he would help anyone, you know. Uh, I've heard rumors that that uh, W.O. had provided uh, the sheriff with a new car every year. They did that. Yeah. W.O. also gave Lyndon Johnson cars. He used to mouth around, and uh, Lyndon would want something. He'd say, well, that SOB, and they'd talk like that, you know. He's wanting another handout. In 1960, I was doing the buying for the political time. Yeah. So Bob Bobbitt, who's now deceased, but uh, was Rebecca Johnson's husband, uh, he called me and he said uh, they were having a political rally in, in Wynwood. And he said, Madeline, I want you to call these people and I want these gifts, automobile, TVs, fur coats. And I looked at this list, list and I said, Bob, these people may not give these big items. He said, I didn't ask you would they get them. I told you to call them and they'll be there. And do you know that everyone, he said, identify myself, which I did, and that they wanted this gift delivered to the uh, Dolphus Hotel. And every one of those gifts, no questions asked, was delivered. And they were big items. I'm talking about nice. But I never did see any anything distributed. Yeah. Okay, uh, another very prominent person that you say was there is J. Edgar Hoover. Tell me more Jagger, about what you know about J. Edgar. J. Edgar, I met him in 48. But when I, growing up, the G-Man series was there. and I was dancing with Lyndon at the Driscoll Hotel. And I looked over and Clint Marcus and I knew him and Jagger Hoover and Clyde Tolson and Sid Richard. And so I said to Lyndon, isn't that that guy 
from the G-Man series, and at that time he told me I didn't, I couldn't see her and I couldn't hear anything. Yeah. Yeah. I met him from time to time. He'd fly into Dallas. He was always a, a guest of Clint Marcus, and they were very close. And La Jolla, California, mm -hmm. they'd fly out there and, and go to horse races. And uh, uh, who, who was the manager, operator, or the owner of that? Uh, the La Jolla Hotel? No, uh, no, the racetrack. Well, Clinton said Richardson owned it. Okay. Uh, I think it was 36, Governor Allred uh -huh. closed the uh, horse races in Texas. So they didn't do anything, but they went out to California and bought them, and all the revenue went to California. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned earlier that uh, someone associated either with the hotel or the racetrack was there at this meeting. Do you remember his name? At the night before the... Yes. Uh, uh, no, but I knew the guy. Uh, I can't think of his name right now. But I went up to uh, Portland, Maine to meet him. Uh, he passed away. He he had a lot of information. He had a lot of receipts who the people went to La Jolla, like Clint. And, but my name never did appear because I was who I was, right. you know. So, uh, but uh, what was his involvement with, with the hotel or the racetrack or what? what? Well, he uh, he was one of the key people that uh, he managed the hotel and and uh, the racetrack. He. Uh, why can't I think of his name? But anyway, I went with an FBI guy to Portland, Maine. And they wanted to know if he would recognize me. Yeah. And the minute he saw me, he, of course he knew me. Right. I had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, another person you mentioned earlier that was there is named Clint Peoples. Clint Peoples was a U.S. Marshal. He was also a Texas Ranger. And I'm really gun shy talking about all of this because Clint Peoples um, was really killed. Um, I talked, Clint was going on a, a camera to verify the things that I said and my friend Billy Saul Estes. And um, anyway, I called Clint. It was on a Friday. I'll distinctively remember that. Yeah. And I said, Clint, I understand you're going on a recorder for Billy Saul and me. They were going to do it as the ending of a movie, yeah. you know. And uh, I said, I can't. I had a sick sister, and I couldn't make arrangements to go. And I said, I'll tell you what I'll do, Clint. I'll uh, I'll come next Friday, and I'll even buy lunch, and then you can be a kept man. Uh, I really like Clint, you know. Well, on Tuesday, following my conversation, Clint was run off the road in Waco, Texas, and ultimately died, uh, passed away from the, his injuries. And um, I, it was interesting yesterday when I talked to Jay Harrison that has long researched this, and he said, Ms. Peoples will not talk to anyone. I said, I beg your pardon. The day she was so totally... Uh, upset. I did not go to the service, but I did talk to her. And I said, Clint lived long enough to tell that he had been run off the road and uh, she thinks he was murdered. Yeah. And that was to keep him from going on a camera to verify anything. Okay. Uh, you mentioned earlier that Bill Decker was at this meeting. Uh, what was but his connection? Oh, he Who was, was he? Bill Decker was the sheriff of Dallas, and um, it was real uh, funny. You used to go anywhere in Dallas, and everything was wide open. And if you wanted, we we often would go and listen to court cases because there wasn't any entertainment. And Bill Decker, being the sheriff of Dallas, you'd go in his office was open, and everything was free. Uh, <clears throat> now, you mentioned earlier that Cliff Carter was at this Cliff private Carter. meeting at Merchant's house. Cliff was uh, head of the organized crime in Washington and had been a friend of Lyndon Johnson's for years and years. And Lyndon and Billy Saul Estes was friends. And that's how Billy Saul got involved with Lyndon was through Cliff Carter. Okay. Uh, See, when Cliff 
he called Billy Saul and he told him that he feared his life. His life was in danger. And uh, uh, again, after he met with Billy Saul, they pulled him out of a cheap hotel at 4 o'clock, but they said he died of natural causes. Yeah. Uh, what what was uh, Cliff Carter's uh, association with Lyndon Johnson? Uh, well, Cliff, when I met him, he was a Seven Up or Coke bottler, uh, Brian, close to College Station. Uh -huh. So it was uh, uh, the Mafia connection. Somewhere. Okay. See, a lot of people do not understand how the Mafia or the organized crime, whatever you want to call it, is involved in our government. It's a, it's a silent government, you know. Yeah. Now let's talk about uh, Malcolm Mac Wallace. Mm, what God, do you know about Mac Wallace? Malcolm, oh Malcolm, bless his heart. In 19, was it 50? Uh, Lyndon's sister was going with John Kinzer. What was Proka, her name? Uh, Josepha. Okay. And she was a disgrace to the Johnson family. Why, why was she a disgrace? Because she was an alcoholic. They'd put her in uh, sanitariums and dry her out and she'd go back. So anyway, Malcolm Wallace, I think, it was a love triangle, yes. best I can determine. So one day, old Malcolm goes in, shoots John Kinzer, the golf pro. Is that Doug Kinzer, John Doug Kinzer? John Douglas Kinzer. Okay. Okay. Here is a guy that killed in cold blood murder. He went to trial. He pleaded guilty. And he gets a five-year probated sentence in Texas. Did he ever go to jail? Uh, I didn't think he ever spent any time in jail, but someone said they did arrest him, but they um, he wasn't in there long. And uh, why, why did he get off such light sentence? Well, we had uh, his name being Wallace. Now, this is my theory, uh -huh. okay? And Jim Ferguson, who had been impeached as the governor of Texas, wife was uh, Amanda, wasn't it? Wallace. So the Wallace name... Uh, Probably. And of course, uh, Amanda loved Lyndon Johnson. It, years ago, if if you had a political end, mm -hmm. you could you could get by with anything. So the laws didn't apply to these people? They made their own rules, they lived by them, right. and they died by them, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so Mac Wallace was at this uh, private meeting at Merchant's house. Uh, what, what was his tie to Cliff Carter and Johnson? Um, uh, Malcolm Wallace was uh, Lyndon Johnson's uh, hatchet man. I mean, there were, I think, about 18, 19 murders that... So he was Johnson's shooter? Yeah. And I used to shoot a lot of skeet and trap. Love it. I love uh -huh. a gun today. And I was out at the Dallas Gun Club, and it was a day or two before the assassination. And who was out there but Malcolm Wallace? And this guy was so great. If he pulled a trigger, he hit his target. I've watched him hour on end. And he loved 22s. Uh, so he was a very accurate shooter. Oh, he was the marksman. Best. He was a good marksman. He didn't miss. Mm -hmm. You know, he was found dead in Marshall, Texas. Was it Marshall? No. One of these Texas, Pittsburgh, maybe, Texas, and um, I understand that it was one car accident. It was a one car accident. Uh, again, someone said he had been killed first and then placed in this car. I know the car was picked up and there were all evidence was removed. I think it was Pittsburgh. He yeah. uh, that they found him dead. Okay. Uh, now, another very uh, prominent person that was at this meeting was a fellow named Carlos Marcello. Who was Carlos? He was the big mafia guy out of New Orleans. What do you know about Carlos? Other than he was head honcho. But see, going way back when, um, what year was it of governor? I can't remember now. But Carlos, if they would pay their dues, they could operate. 
okay? Right. And even the Texas Rangers, because of the organized crime, allowed the mafia to come into Texas. Not many people know that. So that, but as long as they paid their price. When they paid the price, they could operate. Right. Uh, Coke Stevenson was the governor. Uh -huh. And uh, anyway, they uh, all political. Were, were you ever present when uh, Carlos Marcellos uh, met with anyone, Johnson or anyone? He was at uh, that party the night before the assassination. Okay, but were you ever present at, uh, for example, a carousel? When Marshall Did I ever see th th those people would come into those places, and I didn't pay a lot of attention. Um, I know that before a lot of this hit the newspaper, we were playing poker at the Carousel Club, and Jack Ruby came over, and he had he said, "You know what this is?" And I looked up, and I said, "No, what is it?" He had this uh, motorcade route, and. Uh, I said, yeah, Jack, I know that you run with the great white fathers of Dallas. I knew this. I mean, we these are things we just flat knew by association. Right. And, but it stung me that he would be this involved with knowing where the President of the United States. At that time in my life, I thought they were untouchable, you right. know, the, the President. So then, uh, of course, the information came out that you know, about the assassination. Yeah. But they published the final route of the motorcade, and uh, Jess Kellum from Austin named uh, Jack Pewterball. Jack Pewterball, see, there were a lot of agricultural people involved with this assassination. Right. And that's primarily because Lyndon was under the gun over some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Had the assassination not happened, the day that it did, and Lyndon Johnson would have probably gone to prison. They would have gotten rid of him. He was so involved with some of this. Okay, uh, another person you said that was this meeting was a fellow named Joe Savello. Who, who was Joe? He was the head honcho of the mafia in Texas. A real nice person. If you met him, you could never associate him with any anything bad. A real nice guy. Did you ever, were you ever present in, when he had meetings with Johnson or anyone else? Uh, or? He was socially, I don't know what kind of private meetings they had, but socially these people would all, all meet. Yeah. Uh, next person you said was there was a fellow named Jack Ruby. What oh, do you know Jack, about Jack oh. Ruby? Well, Jack Ruby was the end guy in Dallas, Texas. He knew everything that was going on. If you wanted to gamble, you could call Jack Ruby, and Ruby would fix it where you wouldn't be raided in those days. If you wanted a contract out on anyone, you could get anyone whipped for $10, $15, killed for 25 I mean, we had contracts, and not, not a lot of people know about this, but that was going on in Dallas, Texas. You could call Jack and have anything you wanted, prostitution, killing, whatever. He was the head guy. See, when our uh, Henry Wade, that I have known well since he went in the office, the day of the assassination, they were talking about the cheap nightclub Jack Ruby, and he didn't know him. That was a bald-faced lie because Jack Ruby was in that courthouse almost daily because he he brought in drugs, liquor, he violated every kind of law, and he could get by with it. They didn't do anything to him. Uh, what, uh, you mentioned nightclub, what? Carousel. The carousel well, he, he had an interest in some others around, but we would go to the carousel because of the convenience of it. What was uh, Jack's real name? Oh, Rubenstein or something, I don't know. Uh -huh. I never did understand that after Jack killed Lee Harvey Oswald, and we wanted to go see him, and they wouldn't let us. They they wouldn't let us see Jack Ruby. Yeah. What about, uh, you mentioned a fellow named Larry uh, Campbell. Who was, was Larry Campbell? Was he the black Campbell? guy? Black yeah. guy that, uh, was it Hoffa's? Jimmy Hoffa's. Jimmy Hoffa's friend. You know his association with Jimmy Hoffa? Other than they just 
inner inner weave there inner okay. why, why do you think uh, Larry Campbell was this at this meeting uh, well he he probably took up or played a part that no one knew anything about and he himself may not have known what part he was playing okay. but he represented Jimmy Hoffa at this yes. meeting okay let's let's then talk about uh, the people uh, that were at the meeting but or at the social event but did not go into the meeting. Uh, who do you remember was there? Well, I attendance? remember Val M., the, the society editor of the Dallas Times Herald, and that she had written an article about this. And uh, Val M., of course, is presently married to someone that worked or was with the Warren Commission. You can't get her to talk now, but she's talked very freely. Uh, who else was there that you can remember? I knew Char Shirley Pauling, I knew Val I knew Gard McLendon, Dick Knatzer and Don Newberry were salespeople for Cliff, and I know them very well. Uh, I'd like to talk to Helen Thomas because she, at that time I think she worked for the Dallas Morning News, and she made an affidavit about this party. I would I would like to talk to her. Who else was there that you? I was talking about Cactus Prior yesterday at KTBC. <laughs> <laughs> Cactus was a great entertainer. They often use Cactus to, uh, well, to make a party. Okay, so Cactus worked for KTBC at the time. He was Lyndon's. One of Lyndon's people, yeah. and I'm sure still is. Yeah. What about Neil Spells? Do you? I didn't. I didn't know them that okay. well. But but you saw Neil there. Uh, all the the press people were always. Uh -huh. That's why I was invited because to make a party. Yeah. You know? Do you remember Dave Blair? Did, no. Is that name? How about uh, Ted Powers? Is that name familiar? Not to? really. Okay. Uh, Gordon McLennan at that time, what what was Gordon, he? of course, um, he was a Scotchman. He, uh, the media, I don't know how many radio stations he ended up with, but uh, anyway, he, he was part of the great white fathers. Of what, what was his radio station there? KLIF. KLIF, okay. Let's see, K K L T in, in Houston, and he had a number of, of stations. Okay. Now, now let's he talk. killed himself, the best I remember. Okay. You know, a lot of these people, uh, they would either, like Clint Murkison's uh, secretary, yeah. killed herself not too long after the assassination. Mm -hmm. And I've often wondered, if, were they involved or because of the fear or, you know. Maybe guilt know. or fear. Yeah, or it, probably fear in most cases. Yeah. Let's talk about the next day in Dallas. Uh, where were you at the time of the assassination? assassination? I was, uh, I'd packed my car to go to Austin for the big fundraiser. And uh, they were having a meeting of the Democrats down the old red courthouse. And they were fussing, they were, some of them were highly uh, disenchanted about uh, John Kennedy coming to Texas. So here they were wrangling, which was very common. So me, I was lighthearted, and I said, Hey, guys, I'm going on to Austin. I'll see you guys in Austin tonight, and I blew him a kiss. I walked out of the Red Courthouse, and we didn't have all the parking problem. I get in my automobile. You could hear the parade, the noise from the parade. I drove across the Houston Street Viaduct in order to hit the, the highway to go to Austin. And impulsively, I said, I want to have time to have my hair fixed in Austin, so I'll go by, uh, let's see, was it Fair uh, Teiches, the beauty salon, and get my hair freshened so I could go on to Austin. And again, it's about maybe 10 minutes or less trip from the Red Courthouse. And as I walked in the door, they were already on the television that he had been shot. So uh, I asked if I could use the phone. I called. I knew if anything, anyone knew anything, 
it would be just Kellum and Austin because they carried all three networks. So I called Jess and I said, what is going on? First, I called Lou Sterrett at downtown. And I said, my God, what has happened, Lou? And here are people that should have been out at the trademark for the lunch, but they were still downtown. And he said, well, they just shot that SOB. And uh, maybe Lyndon. Well, when, when Lou told me it was Lyndon, of course, it was very upsetting. And I didn't live all that far from the uh, where I had my hair fixed. Jess from my house. I said, Jess, what is going on? And uh, he told me at that time. He even said that he was sure he had passed away. Or was you you thought he was talking about Johnson? Yeah, but, uh, well, yeah, but I had already verified that it was not Lyndon, okay. it was John Conlon. And uh, Kennedy? Yeah. Uh, let's go back to the night before. When, when Johnson came out of the meeting, uh, what did he say to you? He was so angry. He had a violent temper when he was upset. Well, let's use the, the exact words that he said to you. What did he say he, to you? He, uh, he grabbed me by the arm, and he had this deep voice, and he said, after tomorrow, those SOBs will never embarrass me again. That's no threat. That's a promise. And it, it startled me, really, you know, because he was so ruddy-faced. I thought, oh, well, he really, uh, something went on that shouldn't have gone on, you know. But uh, he called me from the Texas hotel the next morning as I was going downtown right. and hear this screaming voice of his. Uh, he was so irate, and uh, he didn't give me—he didn't give me time to talk to him. You know, he just—he uh, was still angry. And when I talked to Jess Kellum right after that, I said, "Wow, he's on a real." violent binge, you know. And then I passed it off. I said, well, after tonight at the Driscoll, he'll be all right. Yeah. And, of course, I didn't see him again until... But what were the words he said to you over the phone? That, uh, that they would never embarrass him again. The, the SOB, the Irish Mafia, I think. He referred to him as the Irish Mafia very often. But he said they would he, never embarrass him again? I'd never embarrass him again. There was no threat. That was a promise. And there were violent feelings that have never been told that was between those two people. There was a picture in the Associated Press that showed uh, Ralph Yarbrough, John Conley, uh, Lyndon Johnson standing behind Kennedy. At, at the Texas and, Hotel. Right. And yeah, uh, if you look at the, at the look on Johnson's face, what, what's your oh, impression? His, his face is snarling. Yeah. And John Conley is so worried or concerned. And after Air Force One got to Lovefield, you see John Conley coming down. Air One was full of glee, and John Conley has this faraway look. Okay. Uh, anything else you'd like to discuss uh, about? Other than it was a political crime yeah. for political power. Uh, and may their souls rest in peace. Now, there's been some comments about uh, Kennedy should have known better to come to, to Texas, uh, uh, and that that one of the reasons that they may have wanted to, to kill him in Texas because Johnson had everything sewed up in Texas. Any, any truth to that? Uh, well, Lyndon had control. Do you know that Jake Pickle, do you know Jake? Yes, I know Jake. That he and John Conley went into every county in Texas and established a Democrat power base. Right. Uh, I haven't seen Jake in a long time, but he had total control of the press in Texas, maybe outside. I only know about, you know, about Texas. You're talking about Johnson now? Yeah, yeah, he did. But uh, the plans, again, to get rid of Kennedy started in 1960, yeah. rather than, they were not just uh, popped up. And people must remember that if the assassination had not happened that day, Lyndon Johnson would have been in heat, bad power, problems. 
when he got to Washington, you know what? The, of course, we didn't have the communications right. in those days. The first thing that Lyndon did, he went to find out what the House and, and Ways Committee, what they did that day. Hmm. That was his first step. Hmm. He was concerned. So he knew that they were they were fixing to indict him. Oh, sure. And That's what happened to uh, Jenkins, the fellow from that had worked so faithfully with him. Yeah. He was going to testify against Lyndon. So what they do, they set him up as a homosexual, and they destroyed him, basically. Well, there's another fellow that uh, we can talk about. Is uh, he was had something to do with the agriculture department and lived in Hearn. I mean, I, 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 the only thing I know that <clears throat> you said that we didn't want to talk about right. Billy okay. Saul, okay. But the agricultural people were very involved uh, in swindling yes. money, all of this stuff. And uh, was it Jack Pewterball? Did he live in Hearn? Uh, there's a fellow named... Uh, Arville Freeman? No, uh, he's in Amarillo. Marshall. Oh, Marshall, but Marshall, yeah, he was the, uh, he was the guy that uh, supposed to have shot himself five times in, in the front, yeah. yeah, Henry Marshall. Henry Marshall. Yeah, Henry, yeah, I knew Henry. <clears throat> uh, he was going to testify too, and uh, uh, they said he, he killed himself, but I, I've never understood how he could take a twenty-two and shoot five bullets into his stomach. A, a bolt action twenty two yeah, rifle. His bolt, bolt action. Yeah, I knew Henry. Yeah. yeah I forgot true. about that. He wasn't from Hearn, was yeah, he? Yeah, he was from Hearn. Really? Yeah. Franklin? Is it Franklin? Franklin's Hearn? near Hearn. Well, they found him dead on the ranch. Yeah. But he was agricultural. Right. There were there were three or four of those guys that were involved uh, he, in that, it. The word is that uh, he was going to testify about the the, the kickbacks uh, to Johnson from the agriculture program, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and yeah. so they need to get rid of him. That's, uh, that's what happened in those years. If if anyone turned against anyone, they came up. Yeah. Missing. Missing. <laughs> <laughs> They're upstairs. <laughs> Somehow they were were dead one way or another. Yeah. Okay. Oh well, let's. Start. One thing we need to cover is your uh, your nanny for your two oh, sons. Uh, let's yeah. go over that. Well, here is the lady who worked for me ten years. What we was worked. her name? Uh, God, <laughs> Gail. My mind is so cluttered. Yeah. Dale. Oh, Dale. God, yeah, Dale. Okay. Anyway, we were at the Minger Hotel, and we. Of course, they would arrange for me to be close to Lyndon, you uh -huh. know. And uh, anyway, we were getting the luggage and everything. She came out, and Lyndon sees me in the hall and grabs me, and and he hugs me and loves me. Of course, I was excited. But Dale went back into the room immediately, almost. She saw you and Johnson yeah, in the hall. Yeah, she did. And he told me that night, tell her goodbye. And I said, well, for why? Of course, I didn't realize the importance yeah. or what it would destroy him. And he said, I didn't want anyone to see us. And I said, it was an accident. And he said, we don't have accidents. So after we came back to Dallas, um, Dale called me at work, and she said she had some business. Well, I live close to my parents. And I said, well, take the boys and, and take them to Mother. Mother always said, help. So I really didn't think a lot of it, but Dale disappeared. We never heard from her. And even today, after all these years, I still try to find out what happened to Dale. So I was talking with some of the end people, and I said, it still grieves me about Dale. And it was so blase, and they said, well, don't you know what happened to her? I said, no. They said Mac Wallace took care of her. And then it hit me. I thought, well, why hadn't I figured it out? Yeah. So yeah. Mac was Johnson's hitman. He, he was the hitman. I can't think of the attorney that really told me that. But uh, But uh, we have a situation where 
an absolute innocent person just sees you and Johnson in the hall, and and that causes her death. That's right. And Johnson didn't think anything at all about having to kill. He had no qualm about death. Just <clears throat> whatever it took to do a job. And I guess maybe a statement is that the the end always justifies the mean. That's right. That's just the way he thought about it. Didn't didn't take didn't matter what it took to get there as long as you got to your goal. That's right. And he did it. Well, Madeline, thank you, and uh, I really appreciate it, and uh, we're going to get the truth out. And, and it just, the public owes you a great debt of thanks for, for coming forward with the truth. And I, um, you know, I probably never would have opened my mouth, but I was so hurt yeah. about my son. I said, I can't, they can't take anything from me anymore. Yeah. And uh, people need to know. That's right. Well, uh, 